Well, welcome everyone. We're glad to see you out uh, for our lecture this evening. Glad to have you join us, uh, virtually at least, for uh, hopeful to get back uh, soon to see you in person. Uh, let me let, uh, mention a couple of upcoming events we've got in our monthly lecture series uh, next month on Wednesday, no, uh, September, not November, Wednesday, September 15th at noon, our next Lunch and Learn will be with Linda Bass and Beth Smith, who will talk about the history of the San Susi Women's Club and the club's record of community service here in Bartow County. And the next uh, September 30th, on Thursday, September 30th at seven, we'll have our next sip and stroll. Uh, we're gonna take an evening stroll through the downtown uh, Cartersville area where we're gonna learn more about the South's moonshining history, including Bartow County's own stories related to distilling and brewing. We'll have stops throughout downtown where you can have a, a, a wine or, or a beer uh, along with some appetizers at our stops. So we encourage you to come out and join us for that. If you've not been on one of those sip and strolls before, they do tend to sell out quickly. So I encourage you to get those tickets soon. And tickets for both of those in-person events can be purchased through our website. So let's go ahead and we'll get started with our program tonight. Uh, tonight's program is being presented by Alexandra Ryder and Heidi Fishman. Alexandra Ryder is an assistant professor of communication with 13 years of experience teaching communication courses at Georgia Highlands College. She received her Bachelor of Science in Communication from Florida State University and her Master's in Organizational, organizational Communication and Executive MBA from Suffolk University in Boston. Alex teaches courses including human communication, intercultural communication, and public speaking. Her mission is to help people become more confident communicators and presenters. Her areas of expertise and focus include speech delivery and presentation, audience analysis, and nonverbal communication. Alex lives in Dallas, Georgia with her husband Brady and their four children, two cats and one dog. Joining her is Heidi Fishman. Heidi is an author and psychologist. She has an MA degree and an EDD degree in counseling psychology and worked at Dartmouth College and in private practice for 20 years focusing on helping people overcome trauma and eating disorders. Heidi speaks to schools and community groups in order to teach about the perils of prejudice and bigotry. She's made multiple visits to the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum in Washington, DC to sign copies of Tootie's Promise. Heidi is also on the board of the Vermont Holocaust Memorial. She lives in Vermont with her husband and when she is staying, not staying home due to COVID safety measures, she likes to travel and discover new places and meet new people. Please join me in welcoming uh, Heidi and Alexandra. I'll pass it on to y'all. Hello, everybody. I'm Alexandra Ryder. Thank you so much for being with Heidi and I today. And I want to thank Trey and Joshua and Lauren and everyone at the Bartow History Museum for all that you've done to help promote this and for letting us share our story with you. It's really quite an amazing story. So this is the second time that Heidi and I are presenting together and that will be in my presentation, but we call this presentation Passports for Life. And it really is just extraordinary set of circumstances that, that brought Heidi and I together. So let's start I guess with my story, which is the next slide. So back in October of 2017, I received an email at my Georgia Highlands email account and I get quite a bit of email there. And so, and I'm used to receiving a lot of random strange email from different people in different places and different parts of the world. And a lot of the times it's spam. So I delete it or I don't read it at all. And this one got my attention because if you look at the subject line, it says looking for Stefan Jan Rinievich. And my heart just stopped for a moment because that is my grandfather's name. And I thought, okay, this isn't a Nigerian prince asking me to wire him some money. So I thought I better read this email. And so I will read it to you. It says as follows, good afternoon. My name is Yenze Yuzinski and I'm looking for any traces of Mr. Stefan Jan Rinievich born in Tarnopol in 1903. Mr. Rinievich, who has been a Polish consul in Latvia in the 1930s and a head of the political science 
excuse me, political section of the Polish legation in Switzerland during World War II, believed to have been one of a Holocaust rescue heroes in the operation recently described by the Polish journalists. And then he links an article here that we have in our bibliography at the end. Currently, I'm searching for any traces of him and his family, his wife, Zofia, and, her, and their two children, Jan Christian and Tomas Maria. They are all believed to have emigrated to Argentina in the early 1950s, where they lived in Buenos Aires. Mr. Inievich is believed to serve, have served as a chairman of the Polish club in Buenos Aires and is believed to have be, been alive as long as 1972, when he was awarded a high decoration for his public service. It is also known that in 1963, one of Mr. Rinievich's sons, Mr. Tomas Rinievich, was married to Patricia Beth Wallens and that the wedding took place in Virginia. Unfortunately, Mr. Tom Tomas Rinievich has died in 1983 under the name Tomas Van Rin and no subsequent information about his family could be obtained. Therefore, I may kindly ask whether you are somehow related to the Rinievich family and whether you are able to shed some light about the final fate of Mr. Stefan Jan Rinievich, sincerely, sincerely yours, Jense Yuzinski. And he was the first secretary to the ambassador of Poland in Bern, Switzerland. So you can imagine my heart stopped, my blood ran cold because my father was Tomas Rinievich my maiden name, when my father moved to the US from Europe, he changed his name from Rinievich to Van Ren. So he basically dropped the R-Y-N and stuck a van in front of it. So he actually found the granddaughter of Stefan Rinievich. And so I had no idea, this was all news to me that this, this even had happened. I knew my family originated in Poland, I knew they moved to Argentina, to Buenos Aires when the war broke out. That is all I knew. So this is how, this is how my story started or, or how my involvement started. And then we move to the next slide. So then Donna Harris of the Daily Tribune News was kind enough to write a story about this whole discovery about my grandfather. And so this, it is linked here, the article, it was published in, on January 5th of 2019. And not even one day later, 24 hours later, I get another email to my Highlands email and it's from Heidi Fishman. And the subject is entitled Paraguayan Passports Holocaust. And then she says, hello, I see the article about you and your grandfather in the Daily Tribune. My grandfather was saved by one of those passports. I live in Vermont but I'll be in the Birmingham, Alabama area in early April to speak about to speak to a school about the Holocaust. I have written a book about my family's experiences. I'm wondering since Birmingham isn't that far from GHC, if we might want to meet up and do a presentation together or something to that effect. My website is 2tspromise.com. So this was really exciting to me when I received this email, just unbelievable. So I'm going to turn it over to Heidi next because the next slide is, is hers. Okay, so how did I get involved in this story? I'm going to back up a little bit on a, a tiny bit of our family history. Basically, my mother is the Holocaust survivor. My grandparents were Holocaust survivors. My uncle was a Holocaust survivor. And whenever I asked the question, well, you know, how did you survive? The answer was always, we had a Paraguayan passport. So fast forward and I, after I retired, I decided I was gonna write a book about my mom's, what, what she went through. And all through the research, five years of research and writing, I kept trying to figure out where the passport came from. I have a copy of it, but I never could get past the, the one friend who handed it over to my grandfather. So we didn't know the origin of the passport. I wrote Tootie's Promise, which is the whole story of what the family went through. It was published in April of 2017. And then, you know, I'm doing my book tours and stuff like that. And in November of 2017, my mother hands me this article. It's in a newsletter that it's put out by Yad Vashem, which is the Holocaust Memorial in Jerusalem. It says he should be as well known as Schindler. It's about a man named Julius Kuhl 
and he was involved with a group of Poles who were making uh, Paraguayan passports and trying to save Jews in Poland. That's what it was saying. Jews in Poland were being saved by these passports. And I looked at this passport in this article and I knew it looked exactly like my grandfather's passport. The same handwriting, the same um, signature, everything was identical. Well, not the specific information, but the information, how it was written was the same. But my mother's family was in Holland. They had nothing to do with Poland. And this article didn't mention anything about Western Europe. So I then wrote this email to Mark McKinnon, who was the one who wrote the article. And I basically said, I read your article, but my grandfather had a Paraguayan passport and he was in Holland. Did this group help the Dutch Jews and the German Jews who had fled to Holland? Well, I did not get an answer from Mark McKinnon. Instead, I get an email from Jakob Kumach, ambassador of, he was, he, he represents Poland in Bern, Switzerland. So this is Jense Uzinski's boss, basically, who emails me. And he says, dear Miss Fishman, I hope this email finds you well. My friend Mark McKinnon has forwarded to me the email you'd send to him. And I would like to answer you. And just sorry, I can't read it because the little pictures are in front. Sorry. Anyway, you, you want me to read yourself. it, Heidi? Huh? You want me to read it? Yeah, you read it because these pictures okay. aren't right. Okay, here we go. It reads, Dear Ms. Fishman, I hope this email finds you well. My friend Mark McKinnon has forwarded to me the email you'd sent him, and I would like to answer you directly. Indeed, I find your information very useful, almost sensational. It means that the passports produced illegally by our noble predecessors, including Julius Kuhl, must have reached the Netherlands too. Before, I must say, I believe that the Dutch passports were produced in Holland and that the role of our diplomats was limited to having created a precedent. The handwriting you're referring to, according to Julius Kuhl himself, minutes from his interrogation on May 22nd, 1944, belongs to Constanti, Constant, wow, Constanti Rokiski, who was a Polish consul in Bern. We estimate that he had personally produced thousands of such documents working many hours a day in a small bu building at Thunstrasse 22 in the center of Bern. That's enough. That's okay. enough. So, so basically, here I suddenly was the missing link to bring the passports that were going to Western Europe to the attention of the researchers in, in Switzerland that were trying to find out more about these passports. And then I saw the article um, about Alex and I immediately had to get in touch with her. And I saw it because somebody, uh, Marcus Blechner, who is a uh, honorary consul of Poland in Lucerne, forwarded it to me. So Alex, back to you. Okay. And I believe Marcus is in Zurich. Zurich, okay. But, okay, neither here nor there. Okay, so now, fat. Flash forward, Heidi contacts me in J January of 2019. She says she's going to be coming to Birmingham. I invite her to come to Georgia Highlands College to present with me at the Cartersville campus. So that's exactly what we did. We came together. We told our story. Heidi explained her family story with the passport. And then I explained how the operation worked and it was really quite extraordinary because it, you know, it talked about just how we came together and how my grandfather essentially saved her grandfather and family. And due to his heroic actions and the actions of the Waters Group, I mean, we're here today. We would not be here today if it not, had not been for the heroism of these gentlemen. So we are really excited to share more information about how this operation worked. But if you want to link, if you want to read that article, it's linked below. That was another great article written by Donna Harris of the Daily Tribune. All right, so this is a complicated slide next. Um, and we're going to just go through it. We're going to take turns explaining the different parts of it and try to lay out how these passports were helping Jews and what, how they were produced, where they came from, and what happened. Right. So Alex, you're going to start here. I'll I'm going to try to point along where we're talking. We're kind of moving 
top to bottom and left to right. So Waros and Rinievich. So the Alexander Waros was the head. He was the ambassador. He was the one in charge. And Rinievich, my grandfather, Stefan Rinievich, was his right hand man. And he basically what his role was, was to provide diplomatic cover up for this operation. So first let me talk about Waters. Waters was the Polish ambassador at the Polish legation in Bern between 1940 and 1945. What you need to understand is that Poland was in exile during World War II. So they could not operate as an embassy. They had to be a legation and they had to leave Poland. So they were operating in Bern, Switzerland. Now, my grandfather was Wadosh's right-hand man, and his primary role was to allow the fabrication of the passports to be done within the consulate, to communicate with the Polish government, who was in London in exile. He also asked foreign governments to honor these fabricated documents, and he actually threatened the Swiss police when the operation was under scrutiny and, and being looked at very closely. Yeah, that so, was, that, he actually said something to the effect of, um, you know, you really don't want to, um, you don't want to bring this to light. You don't want to make a big deal of it because you're going to look bad, Swiss police. You, you want to keep this quiet. It's right. going to look bad for you guys. He very kindly and, and firmly asked them to look the other way. So Julius Kuhl, who was in uh, that article that, that I had found earlier, he was a Orthodox Jew that had dropped out of yeshiva and he wanted to be a political scientist. He wanted to work within the, um, it, he, was, he was Polish, he was in Switzerland and he wanted to work for the embassy. And so what he did was he would go to Alexander Wadoś and um, play chess with him and purposely lose to get into his good graces. And as a result of that, he was hired to work in the legation. Because he was an Orthodox Jew, he knew, he had contacts with like lots of Jewish groups within Switzerland. He knew where the different synagogues were. He knew who the leaders were and he was working in the legation. So he knew the diplomats. So he became, becomes the in-between person. Um, and he is in touch with Abraham Silberschein and Chaim Ice. Silberschein is a, uh, another Polish Jew who happened to be in Switzerland when the war broke out. And he founded a, com a um, organization he called Relico, which was a refugee um, what, it, what does RELICO actually stand for? I should tell you that. It was the Relief Committee for War-Stricken Stru Jewish Population. He was trying to help Jews throughout Europe and collect money and find people safety and things like that. And Chaim Ice was a right-wing ultra-Orthodox Jew who was also had lots of connections within Switzerland. What they did was they would get information from Jews throughout Europe with their pictures. That was the biggest thing. For a passport, you need that little one by one or two by two picture to staple to the passport. And people were sending them letters. Uncle Abraham, um, here is a picture from our wedding so you can remember the event. He wasn't their uncle and he wasn't at their wedding, but people were sending pictures, then writing the names on the back and sending it to them. And then they were also raising money internationally from the United States, from Canada, from wherever they could to get money for this operation. They would take the photos, they would take the cash, they would take all the personal information, birth dates and who was related to whom and such, and give it to Konstanty Rokiski, who was also part of the legation. Alex. Okay, so now I'm taking over. So Rokiski was part of the legation. He worked with, he worked with Wadosh and Rinievich. His role was to get the information from Silverstein and Ice. And once, but then he had, to, he had to put them in the passports, right? So how did he get these passports? This is the question. If you look at the green box on the far right, you see these, these countries listed. We have Haiti, Honduras, El Salvador, Peru, and Paraguay. 
and there were honorary consuls operating for each of these countries. These consuls are the ones that profited. Uh, they actually made a monetary profit from this operation. I want you to know that my grandfather and the entire Waters group, they didn't earn a penny. They did this because it was the right thing to do as a humanitarian effort. The consuls on their hand were happy to take the money and give them legitimate blank passports. So they were, Rokiski was getting passports from Paraguay, from Honduras, from Haiti, from El Salvador. The names on the right, Bauer, Montello, Barreto, and Hoogley, those were the honorary consuls. We don't know who the consul was for Haiti. That's why there's a question mark there. Now, Heidi's grandfather's passport was Paraguayan. So it did come from Hoogley, but Hoogley was not the only person that only consul that was operating here. So Rokiski gives the money to the consuls, receives the blank passports, and then fills them out with all of the information, the photographs and all, all the handwriting is Rokiski's. And that's what you have to understand. He was, he was not the signature man, but he was the handwriting because at each one of these was hand printed. And, and keep in mind, there was a passport per family, not per person like it is in today's society. So one passport per family with everyone's photos. And then once he had all the information and the information put in and the pictures, he would then give the consuls back the passports to get the official signature. And then once he had that, he would then give the finished passports back to Silvershine and Ice. And that's where I'm gonna hand it back over to Heidi. Okay, so then Silvershine and Ice get these passports now, it would have been really illegal to give people all these passports um, from the different countries that they had nothing to do with. And then eventually they would have been able to go back and like go to Paraguay and go to Peru and say, but I'm a citizen, let me in. They didn't want it to be that illegal. So what they did was they copied the passports and they kept, they kept the originals in Bern. And then the copies, a lot of them with a notarization saying this is a true copy was given to the various people that needed help throughout Europe. So my family, my, my grandfather ended up with a copy of a passport saying he was Paraguayan with a notarization that says that this is a true copy. What, the, what then happened was the the Jews who had these papers were able to show them to the Nazis and say, I am not a stateless Jew from somewhere in Europe. I am Paraguayan, I am Honduran, and this is a neutral country. You do not want to get my government mad at you, basically. You don't wanna pull in another country to join the allies, so don't treat me badly. Not quite in those words, but that's what the implication was. And a lot of these people were put into, um, the, I'm gonna say in quotes, the better concentration camps. They weren't sent to death camps. They were sent to more holding camps. And the, the Germans were thinking that they could use these people as exchange for German POWs, or after the war was over when they won and the Third Reich was going wonderfully and the German nationals from around the world wanted to come home, they would use them as exchange. Um, Silberstein and Ice got the copies to the different people, sometimes through the ordinary mail, through couriers, through the underground, wh wh any way they could to just get the get this stuff from Switzerland to the various people. And like my grandfather's passport, we're not exactly sure, but we think it was smuggled into Germany and then mailed from Germany to Amsterdam to a friend of my grandfather's and then handed off to him. It was all very complicated. Next slide. Yes, that's such a well done slide though, Heidi. I love the, the flow chart is great. All took right. several tries to get that where I could understand. Yes, well, it's awesome, I have to tell you. Okay, now this is also a little bit, not as complicated, but just a lot of words here. And I'm just gonna go ahead and read it because, but let me tell you what it, what it is first. So Abraham Silbershine was interrogated by the Swiss police and this was not good. So what I'm about to read is his statement, which is shown here on the left and highlighted, which was in French. And I am reading what, 
what he was asked by the police and how he responded. So the Swiss police say to Silvershine, we visited your office and your house. We found an important group of new passports from diverse countries in South America and recently delivered to Switzerland. Could you explain to us in a complete and true manner what you were doing with these passports? So he answers, a couple of months ago, I had a meeting in Bern at the Polish legation with Mr. Reniewicz, the secretary of the legation, and with, with Mr. Rokiski, who directs the consular section in Bern. These gentlemen brought to my attention the fact that certain persons in Switzerland took it upon themselves to furnish passports from South American countries to Poles who found themselves in various countries occupied by Germany. These passports permitted the holders to obtain an amelioration of their fate. We found ourselves in the presence of a true black market of passports. And these gentlemen from the legation made known their desire for me to take responsibility for this affair. And I have accepted in the name of Relico. This helped the holders paying large amounts. I must state that 80% of the passports were retained at the cost of the Universal Jewish Congress Committee. So he basically, I mean, it, it, they had been, it, there had been a huge, I mean, it was, they were expensive. And then when the legation took over, they managed to get it all into a, basically tell the consuls, we'll only give you this much money, but there'll be more passports that we'll get, we'll be doing. So they saved everybody that money individually. Um, but, and there's hundreds of these documents of these different interrogations. Um, this is just one. I know for a fact that my grandfather had, had said on more than one occasion to, to the Swiss to look the other way, to yeah. look, we're doing, we are doing humanitarian work here and you need to focus your efforts elsewhere. So they were trying to do this before the Nazis discovered it. So let's, now we're going to break down the members of the Wadosh group. So what's important here, the common link is of course, they all work together to save Jews during World War II, but they were all Poles. All of these gentlemen were Polish. There were three Christian men and three Jewish men. So we're gonna start left to right on the screen. We're gonna start with Alexander Wadosh, who was the head of the group. And he was the Polish envoy or ambassador to Switzerland between 1940 and 1945. And interestingly enough, this was Jakob Kumach's role many, 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 many years later. And you heard us refer to him earlier in our presentation. So he, this group is called the Wadosh Group just because he was the head of the group. The next, I'm gonna hand it over to Heidi. Abraham Silbershine, he's the one who founded the Relico Relief Committee for War Stricken Jewish Population. He was a member of the World Jewish Congress and of the Polish Parliament in 1922 to 1927. He arrived in Switzerland three weeks before the outbreak of the war. He provided the personal data and photographs of people for whom the passports were issued, and he was responsible for securing the financial support for the operation. So next we have Konstanty Rokiski. Rokiski was the gentleman that hand wrote the information into the passports and put the pictures in that he was given. And he was the deputy counsel working under Wadosh and he had a very, very important role. They all did. But Rokiski uh, will be noted later that he was treated a little bit differently or recognized a little bit differently. And we're going to address that. We're hoping that the other members will get the same, the, the same respect and, and appreciation and admiration for what they did because each one of these men were just incredible. They could not have done this in and of themselves. They needed each other to make this work. So I'm going to hand it off to Heidi next. So Chaim Ice, um, he was an Orthodox Jew, not just Orthodox, ultra, he was ultra Orthodox. He was one of the founders of um, Agudath Israel, which is again, a very right-wing ultra Orthodox organization. And he organized the smuggling network to get the passports to the various people. And he actually, he died of a heart attack in 1943 in the middle of the whole operation and he was the one who had the originals. Um, when the researchers in, in Switzerland, the Polish, the Polish 
researchers that were in Switzerland in Bern under Jakob Humach were trying to put all this together. They um, found a whole archive of these passports in Israel from a relative of ICE. And I just want to point out, which I forgot to say earlier, Silbershine, on the other hand, was a left-wing Zionist, also got very religious, but he was more of the liberal Zionism versus the ultra-Orthodox. A very These two types of Jews don't necessarily get along with each other most of the time. Okay. Yeah. Very interesting. <laughs> now we move on to Stefan Rinievich, my grandfather. He was the right hand to Rinievich. He was the he was the one that provided the diplomatic cover. He was speaking to the Swiss authorities, asking them to look the other way. He intervened with the local foreign minister when, when they were discovered. He was the one who would intervene and helped to quiet the case, to have them look the other way, to hush it up before it got blown out of proportion. And my, my grandfather was, uh, very instrumental because that you need someone to pacify people, right? You need someone to calm people down and divert people and distract people. So that was one of his many roles, as well as asking the foreign governments to honor these passports that were that were real but yet fake, right? They weren't used. They weren't meant to be used for travel. They were just meant to prove that they, the the people that the, that held them were from neutral countries and that they were to be left alone. So. Okay. And then we have Julius Kuhl, who, I mean, if you look at the birth dates of these men, he was the baby of the group. He was only 26 years old when the war broke out in, in 1939. And he was the one who basically got the, the, the legation, Wadosz, Rokiski, and Renievich, in touch with Ice and Silbershine. He put them all on the same page with each other through all his connections. And that was him, you know, he was wheeling and dealing and uh, playing chess and losing and getting on people's good sides to get this all started. I do want to pop back in and say one thing about Rokiski that is, is important to note that he is known to have fil personally filled in at least 1,000 Paraguayan passports. And unfortunately, after the war, he remained in, in Switzerland, but he died in poverty. And, but what is very, very interesting to note is that Yad Vashem granted Konstanty Rokiski the title of righteous among the nations, which is the highest honor you could receive from Israel. But only Rokiski was given this, this honor and the rest of the, the waters group was not. So this is something we're hoping will change in the future, but definitely. And, and the, 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 if you're Jewish, you don't get to be righteous among the nations. It is only an honor bestowed on non-Jews um, because if you're Jewish, you're just expected to help your fellow Jew. It's, it's not anything special to do that. Whereas they, they, it's, it's an it's a, it's a honor for non-Christian, non-Jewish non people. Right. Yeah. So, all right, I would like to just, explain how this passport helped my family. So here's my grandfather, Heinz Lichtenstern, my grandmother, Margaret Lichtenstern, and my mother, Tootie, born in 1935, and my uncle, Robbie, born in 1938. They lived in Cologne, Germany, when uh, my mom was born in 1935, and in 1936, my grandfather said, we're getting out of here, move the family to Amsterdam. They managed to stay relatively safe. Things were okay for them until 1944. Now that's an unusual story in itself. And there's lots of twists and turns. And it has to do with my fact that my grandfather was a scrap metal buyer and seller. Um, if you wanna know more about that part of the story, get to his promise, but we don't have time right now. <laughs> um, in February 1944, they ended up being uh, brought to Westerbork, which was the transit camp in the eastern part of the Netherlands. Uh, most people who were brought there were only sent there, only stayed for a, a couple weeks or maybe a month, and then they'd be sent on to another camp, usually Auschwitz, um, to Traisenstadt. The family was there for um, six months, eight months, and then they were sent 
to Trezenstadt. That was a camp outside of Prague and it was not a death camp. It was also, it was sometimes people call it a concentration camp, sometimes a ghetto. It had horrible conditions. Uh, 33,000 people died there of malnutrition and disease, not gas chambers. 33,000 people died because they starved. Um, so you didn't have to get to a gas chamber to be killed by the Nazis. So that's where the family was. In September, September 24th, 1944, in Trezenstadt, this notice comes out. I'm not going to read it to you, um, but what it is, it's, it's a notice saying that the next couple of days, they were gonna start having transports going east to an undisclosed place, which turned out to be Auschwitz. The first of which was going to have 2,500 men on the transport and they would be aged 16 to 55. There would be no exceptions. Over the course of the next month, there were 11 transports with over 18,000 inmates from Trezenstadt that were sent to Auschwitz. Some of them were all men, some were women, some were basically old people or children or mothers and children. It, they, they just picked different segments of, of, of people and were sending them off in large quantities at a time. My grandfather was in that 16 to 55 and this tran this notice meant he was on the next transport. My mother tells the story that he came to her in her on her bunk in her um, barracks and wept and said goodbye. And it was, I, I tear up when I tell the story. Um, if you can imagine being seven years old and your father coming to you and saying, they're sending me away, I will probably never see you again because he knew he would be killed. And the next day he had to go to the train. He goes to the uh, area where they board the train and he had this passport. Here's his passport. It's got his, it's a family passport. My grandfather, my grandmother, my mother, my uncle. It's from, it says the Republic of Paraguay, but it was put together in Bern. And this is the notarization that says this is a true copy of the original signed by Hoogly. And this is that Rokiski handwriting that I've, I've come to recognize. And somebody who knows my grandfather says, don't you have one of those passports? He goes, yeah, but it didn't stop me from going to Westerbork. It didn't stop me from going to Trezenshut. It doesn't work. They said, try again. And he showed the passport and he's given this piece of paper. It says Ausgeschieden, which means withdrawn. And this is his camp number and his name. And this is the beginning of his birth date. And that day there were supposed to be 2,500 people on the transport, but only 2,499 went to Auschwitz. So that piece of paper literally saved his life. And I am sure if they didn't have that passport and he had gone on the next transport that had women, my grandmother would have gone and the transport with the children would have had my mother and the family would have been gone, but they had the passport. So how many passports were there? The researchers are still trying to figure this out. They're, they think there were between 8,000 and 9,000 people represented on these passports. Remember they are family passports. Some have one person, some have five people. It just depends on the size of the family. They've identified over 3,000 names. They're still looking for more. And they believe that probably statistically between three and 4,000 people probably survived because of these passports. So this operation was huge, just absolutely huge. And the reason they think even though they found only 3,000 names, they think it's bigger is because each passport has a serial number on it. And there's like beginnings of the serial numbers. And then there's a bunch that are later and there's numbers missing in the middle. So they, they assume if you fill in all those numbers, it would be that many passports. All right. All right. Shift to Alex now. Hey, okay. So 
I tear up too when I hear you talk about this. It's just, it's just so amazing to me. It's so incredible. So the Virtus et Fraternitas Medal, which I was honored to accept on the behalf of the Rinievich family, was awarded in June of 2019. I was contacted by the Pilevsky Institute, which is a, a, an amazing nonprofit organization based in Warsaw, dedicated to remembering and praising and honoring Jews, or excuse me, Pol Polish people. They were the ones that spoke to the president of Poland and asked that the members of the Waters Group and other people be recognized for their heroic efforts, their humanitarian efforts in saving Jews in World War II. Because let's face it, it wasn't just my grandfather, it just wasn't the Waters Group. There were a lot of people that were doing good, kind-hearted deeds, that they were risking their own life and limb in the name of humanity to help other people. So now I wanna tell you a little bit about the medal and my story about how I went to accept it. It's also a crazy story. So the president of the Republic of Poland, Andrzej Duda presented this the, the medals on June 19th of 2019. I think every day how grateful I am that this happened prior to COVID-19 breaking out because well, our life has changed dramatically, right? So. I traveled there with my husband, my, our four daughters, and my mother, who was married to Stefan's son, Tomas Rinievich. And so we went to Warsaw, uh, and we actually traveled from Hawaii, which was another crazy story, but my, my oldest daughter graduated from high school. We had a family trip, and they weren't sure. They knew they were going to do this ceremony, but they didn't know when. When they finally decided on the date, I was right in the middle of being in Hawaii. So we actually went from Maui to Warsaw. That was quite a travel, but it was well worth it. And this, it was just being a part of history. So it was the first time ever that this medal was awarded. They, uh, President Duda has since awarded additional medals to people identified as helping Jews. And that was in 2021. Uh, at this particular ceremony, 14 people were honored to and received this award, but 12 of them posthumously. So only two people were alive to accept their medal. And this book right here, this was the, this was the program. And in the program, it highlights all of the people that were recipients of this award and their story. And half of it's written in Polish, half of it's written in English. We, I get to one of the next slides. I'm going to read you what they wrote about my grandfather. Uh, well, okay, you so want that one? Well, not yet. So actually, this is this is the slide or a slide of what this is. Okay, the name Virtus e Fraternitas means virtue and brotherhood. So that's the name. Of, that's what the name of the medal means. And I love this quote by President Duda. He said in regards to this medal and, and awarding it to these recipients that this is dedicated to nobility, brotherhood, heart, and above all, an extremely human attitude for an extremely humanitarian attitude, extraordinary hu humanism shown in very difficult times. Because again, I cannot even fathom being alive during World War II. I cannot imagine what it was like to be a Jew in World War II and to know that in any moment you could be killed. And the fact that my grandfather and these men risked everything to help others is, is indeed noble. The designation to receive this honor is basically it's awarded to people meritorious in helping or cherishing the memory of Polish nationals or Polish citizens of other nationalities who are victims of either Soviet crimes, Nazi German crimes, crimes on nationalist motives or other crimes constituting crimes against peace, humanity or war crimes in the period of 1917 to 1990. So it's a wide range. I mean, we all know that injustice and, and has been happening for years and years. Now, when I received the medal on behalf of my grandfather in 2019, there were, like I said, there were 14 people that received the medal, they're all documented in this book, and they included all six members of the Waters Group, but they also included people that housed Jews, 
cared for the graves of Polish people that were exterminated. There was, in fact, the one of the two people that were alive that accepted the awards. One woman was seven years old when her father was helping in Ukraine, helping Poles that escaped, but were eventually killed. And he buried these Polish people and the daughter tended to the graves, brought them flowers, prayed for them and actually helped other archeologists discover these mass burial sites. This woman, Alexandra was honored with this medal. And it was incredible to see her because imagine being seven years old and helping to do something like this. So it, just the stories are amazing. There was also a Hungarian general who refused to surrender his Polish prisoners of war in Hungary to the Germans. He told the Germans to buzz off that, no, you can't have these Poles. And so he risked everything to protect his Polish brothers in arms. So just amazing stories each and every one of them, it was incredible. So the next slide is just a picture of, again, the program from the event. And I'll just quickly read what they wrote about my grandfather again. And it was half in Polish and half in English. And so about Stefan Jan Reniewicz, he was born in 1903, died in 1988. His diplomatic career began in 1928 at the Polish embassy in Bern from 1928 to 1933. Next, he was employed in the cabinet of Joseph Beck, the Minister of Foreign Affairs. He was the Polish consul in Riga in the years of 1935 to 38, before he returned to the embassy in Bern as the first secretary and from 1943 as an advisor. He was the deputy to Alexander Wadosh and a member of the group which issued illegal Latin American passports to persecuted Jews. Rinievich's role was to provide diplomatic cover-up and security to the operation. He convinced Latin American diplomats to acknowledge the passports and he maintained contact with Jewish organizations. When the Swiss authorities discovered the passport campaign in 1943, he intervened with the head of the Swiss police, helping to keep the operation quiet. He remained in Switzerland after the war and then went to France. From there, he emigrated to Buenos Aires, Argentina, where he ran his own business. He was the member of the Polish diaspora and the chairman of the Polish club, and he died in Buenos Aires in 1988. A little bit of story on my grandfather. Next slide. This is a photograph of the actual medal. If you look behind me on my video, you'll see a shadow box on the wall, which I'll be happy to walk over my computer later so you can get a closer look at it. But I did have the, the metal shadow box because it's one of the most incredible things that I own. And that is the certificate of authenticity signed by President Duda. And it's all in Polish, but you, you kind of get the gist. You can read the name and the date and it says Warsaw. It was issued May 28th of 2019, but it was given to me on June 19th. 2019, which I actually find very ironic that it was June, June 19th or Juneteenth. So I just think that's kind of a neat coincidence. Okay. And then this was the most incredible moment of my life, one of them at least, uh, the presentation of getting this award. I didn't even know what to expect, but when I got there, it I felt like I was on, I was on the stage about to receive an Oscar or an Emmy. It was quite a quite a big setup, and I was on the stage with all the, the fourteen recipients, and the presentation was entirely in Polish. We were to wear little earpieces that were translating it into English. There was a delay; I couldn't understand. My heart was beating out of my chest. I didn't know what to do. I just knew that when they called, you know, I knew we were lined up in the order that we would be called. And so I just kept breathing and telling myself, don't trip and don't cry. Don't trip and don't cry. I mean, I kept saying it over in my head because I'm not exactly the most graceful person in the world. So I was a little nervous walking across the stage to get this. So Heidi's gonna play, actually I had a photograph, but I found this video and I thought what better to show a video of the moment where they were calling me across the stage to get the medal. Stefan Reniewicz, członek grupy berlińskiej prowadzącej szeroką działalność ratowania sztuki terenu uchwalony przez Niemców Polski podczas II wojny światowej. To znaczy odbiera wnuczkę pani Aleksandra Zofia Rejka.
Now you're probably wondering what I said to the president of Poland and I told him that it was such an honor to accept this award and to meet him. And he told me that the honor was all mine or all his, excuse me. And he kissed my hand. And again, I'm just sitting here trying not to cry in front of the president of Poland, but it was, it was truly amazing. And then Donna Harris was kind enough to write a story detailing this. You can access it on the Daily Tribune's website, but that was published in February of 2021. Oh, wait a minute, sorry. Okay, so on this trip, we were in Poland for a little bit, around a week's time. It took about a day and a half to recover from the jet lag from Hawaii, but we, we spent the majority of our time in Warsaw, but I had to visit Auschwitz. There was no way that I was going to go to Poland and not visit this place, and I, I cannot tell you the emotion that ran through me when I visited. It was, you can't even, it's really hard to describe because you read about it, you watch movies about it, but it, there's nothing that replaces seeing this in person. I was horrified to the core. I was upset because there were a lot of people taking selfies and pictures. And I thought, this is, this is, this is not where you do this. And so I really, I was just physically and emotionally ill after experiencing this. And if you look, that's the train track that leads you there. On the right, that is a, you know, a cattle car that they would pack the Jews in, just hundreds of people in this enclosed space with barely, you know, no food, no water, very hot temperatures just piled on top of each other. And if you passed out, you wouldn't even hit the ground because you, there were people on every side of you. And so, it, like I said, I, I just, if you ever have an opportunity to visit any of the concentration camps, you need to, because I don't think you will truly ever understand as a human, the horrors of what happened. And something that I need to mention is that my mother is a Jew. So by, by, by Jewish law, I'm, I'm Jewish. My father was Christian, my mother was Jewish. My grandfather was Christian, my grandfather was helping the Jews. Amazing story, right? So I went with my family, I was honored to be able to bring my children there. And uh, it's just something that I'll never forget. So the next slide is also Auschwitz, just by the numbers. And I want you to look at the numbers on the right. These are just for Auschwitz. This doesn't even include all of the other camps out there. The numbers are horrifying. It is just unbelievable what happened. And you know, the quote on the left, it just, it haunts me by George Santanaya. It, it's, if we don't remember the past, we are condemned to repeat it. And I just, I never want this erased from people's memories. I want people to understand uh, the far reaching implications of, of Nazi Germany, Nazi Europe and, and what the Jews went through. Because if we don't watch ourselves, this could happen again, if we're not careful. So I want to put well, that out. It has happened again to different degrees and different- Well, right, countries. not to quite the same degree it is, I mean, there is, there are plenty of places where people hate each other enough where they round up the other and kill them. That's it's, it's just horrible. Happening. It's, it's unbelievable. Okay, next slide. And this is a happy slide. So this is my, me and my family. My mother is to the left of me. My husband is on the right. The woman on the right of my husband is actually my godmother who's Swiss. She's from Zurich. And she came over for the event to Warsaw. And then those are our four daughters, which at the time were 18, 16, 10 and eight, uh, 12 and 10, excuse me. So really exciting that they got to come with me. And then I just wanna talk a little bit about this gentleman. I was really honored to meet Sebastian Wadosh and he, is the great grand nephew of Alexander Wadosh. So his grandfather was Wadosh's brother, okay? Alexander Wadosh did not have any children. 
So he is the great grand nephew of Alexander Waters. He is an attorney that lives in Warsaw and he has written a book entitled When God Looks Away. It's pictured right there on the left. You can get it on Amazon. The only downside is it's written in Polish. It has not been translated in English yet. So unfortunately, that's not going to help us very much, but it is a biography about Alexander Waters. So he's a fantastic human. I was super excited to meet him. And I met other members of the Waters, uh, well, the Waters group, Rokiski's granddaughter and just people who are related to Julius Kuhl. I mean, just, it was really amazing. Okay. And then I think that's the end of my slide. It's back to you. Back to me. So one of the things that we just really want to point out is that this was a group of people who under other circumstances would not have necessarily been friends, wouldn't have had the same um, uh, political standing, the, 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 what they might have done. So we've got the Christian Polish diplomats. We have an Orthodox Jewish Polish diplomat. We have a right-wing ultra-Orthodox Jew. We have a left-wing Jewish Zionist. Um, and ordinary citizens. This is my grandfather's friend um, who actually handed him the passport as far as we know. And you know, people across Europe who, these people didn't know each other. These, these six knew each other, but my grandfather's friend didn't know these guys. And, and the diplomats didn't know the people that were in peril. They didn't, it's not like they were just helping their friends or they were just helping Poles. They were helping anybody they could. So we have people working together and helping strangers just because it was the right thing to do. And that is so important. I just wish we could all sort of take that lesson away for, it doesn't have to be dire circumstances like this. It could be a smaller circumstances in our own lives. Um, the Righteous Among the Nations, we've talked a little bit about that already. Yad Vashem is the Holocaust Memorial in Jerusalem. Konstantin Rokiski has got, been granted Righteous Among the Nations, which is the highest honor. Um, Jews are not eligible to get that honor, again, only non-Jews. And um, when they went, when the application went in to have the, the Christians from the Wadosh group be accepted as righteous among the nations. They only gave a offer of appreciation to Alexander Wadosh and Stefan Runevich. Um, and they, it, it seems like they misunderstood who everybody was. They thought that Runevich and Wados were um, the consuls to Rokiski, that Rokiski was in charge. They didn't understand that it all worked by them working together. So it's still under investigation. They're still considering whether they might grant this. And actually there's a letter from the president of Israel saying, um, we're working on it, we'll, we'll let you know. Um, and then if anybody really you know, wants, you can take a screenshot of this, this slide, but um, the different books that we have, um, if my book, Tootie's Promise, which is not necessarily about the passport operation, but it is about the family and how the passport Save the lives, uh, you know, that, that figures prominently. This book is called the, the Wadosh List, and it has names of all the people that they've discovered so far that had these documents and what their fates were. And Sebastian Wadosh's book, which is a biography of Alexander Wadosh. And then we have listed all the articles, not even all of them, there's probably more, but if you basically Google Paraguayan passports, Latin American passports, World War II, Holocaust, Poles, you'll find them. They're out there on the internet. Um, I have a website, I call it Papia and Me, or you can go to HeidiFishman.com. Um, Papia is the name of my mother's doll, and that's part of the book too. And passportsforlife.pl, because it's from the Pilecki Institute in Poland. There's a lot more information there about the whole operation. Heidi and Alex, this has uh, been such an incredible story to hear um, and, and, and learn more about. What's next for the two of you? Are y'all um, doing more of these kinds of presentations, more research, uh, looking for more of these families? 
Um, well, looking for more of the families, we're going to let the um, the researchers at Pileski work on that. Um, I would what I I would really like to write a book of short stories of different families and how the passports um, affected them. You know, you know this. You know, I, I can make my grandfather's story a little short story, but then how many other of the survivors or their children can I find to tell the story of what happened to their family with that passport? Because um, I think that would just be, I, I think that'd be great to read. Um, I would love to see all the passport families together, like to somehow. I mean, once we get through COVID and it's safe. I just think it would be amazing to meet because I know, I mean, I just think it's amazing that we got connected, Heidi. And I think about that every day. I think about my grandfather saved your grandfather. And what if, and what if? Yeah, I wouldn't be here if it wasn't for your grandfather. I wouldn't be alive. Well, I may not be here either. <laughs> so. We are both on a committee. It's the International Committee for the, the Wadosh Group. Um, and there are um, Polish politicians on there. There are Israeli um, survivors. There are Swiss diplomats. It's just like like this incredible array of people. Um, and we're we're going to try to keep this this story, get it out there into the public because it is such a. Um, it's a story of hope and people doing the right thing at the right time and putting themselves in harm's way to just save someone else just because it's the right thing to do. Right. And, and we want that story out there. I think we need more, more people willing to be like that more often and the world would be better. We really need that. Well, no, that's a very, um, something to be proud about. And, and we certainly appreciate y'all coming out tonight and telling us the story and sharing this with us. Um, and absolutely, I echo everyone that said write a book. We'd love to see that and, and, and uh, hear more of these stories. And um, thank you all for, for putting it out there and for, for coming together. And uh, you mentioned Donna Harris in the newspaper. I'm so glad she wrote those articles because that's how we discovered you. And, right. She's um, amazing. I did invite her tonight. She had a prior commitment. And uh, but Jason Greenberg, the editor, he was awesome as well. Right. He allowed me to get access and everything to the because I have the, the newspapers, but I don't have them pretty in digital form. So I needed mm -hmm. them for the PowerPoint. So I'm, I'm thankful to both of them. I'm thankful to GHC and the Cartersville community in general, just for supporting this story and, and following it. And hopefully it'll just keep unfolding and there'll be more great news to share. So thank you so much. Great. Well, uh, thank you again. And, and thank you everyone for, for joining us this evening. We um, appreciate that. And we hope to see you again uh, in the museum soon.